kind of like Edison did, where you know he would sit in a chair and hold a hammer in his hand, and he would sit there and he would begin to imagine things and kind of like get on the verge of sleep, and then it, he would drop the hammer and it'd wake him up. You know, <laughs> like it's it's my hope that I'm creating this space for the audience to just bask in an emotional world. I'm Ethan Sperry, the artistic director and conductor of Oregon Repertory Singers. And this spring, we're presenting a concert called Come to the Woods, featuring guest composer and conductor Jake Runestad, who just writes the most extraordinarily beautiful choral music on a whole variety of subjects. I was lucky enough to spend an hour with him online talking about his music, and here's a chance to learn a little bit more about what you'll be seeing on stage in a couple of weeks. To me, one of the reasons that I, that I think, well, there's so many reasons your music is catching on, uh, other than the fact that it's awesome, but uh, you construct such interesting librettos and go to like new places, and that's something Morton Lauritsen always emphasized. He spent such a long time looking for poetry, and you know, then Paul Salamatovich convinced, uh, commissioned him to write a No Manu Mysterium, and he's like, "Really? The world needs another." <laughs> <laughs> and, and then, Paul... like now, like after he's written, it's like, no, there's no one should ever write another one. There's just no I know because he's got. <laughs> I know, but Paul was all grumpy. He's like, "I'm a Catholic. This is my favorite text. <laughs> You're the composer in residence. Just do it. but like." So where did you find like the journals of John Muir? What what gave you the yeah. idea that like this could be a choral work? I mean, it's it's such a cool idea and it works so well, but it would just never have occurred to me. Well, I think you know finding the text is really the longest part of my process. Mm -hmm. uh, it takes longer than writing the music, and that doesn't mean that me writing music isn't hard. Yeah, but I just spend so much time on the front end mm -hmm. trying to learn as much as I can um, to study about the person that I'm writing about, you know, all of these kinds of things. Um, and then of course, then there's finding the text and that's, you know, on the Sierra club website, they've got an archive of all of John Muir's writings, his journals, his, his published writings. So it's an amazing resource. And, and I've always loved Yosemite national park, loved that he was a foundational part of our, of our national park system in the USA. Yeah. And so I thought it would be, it, what would it be like to, to try to embody his persona in a piece of, of art, in a piece of music? And so I think, you know, John Muir was a fascinating person, born in Scotland, raised in Wisconsin, moved to California around age 30-ish, um, and then fell in love with the Yosemite Valley and wanted to protect it. Um, and you know, there is some complexity there of who was living in that area and how it was sure. protected. Um, but I think ultimately the hope was to protect these beautiful spaces in our country from further development mm -hmm. um, by society. And so I think ultimately that's a very good thing. And, um, and so, yeah, just learning as much as I could about that history, about John Muir, and then going through all of his writings and trying to find what's a central image that I could use in a piece. And so it's this story of when John Muir, you know, I imagine him kind of frolicking down the trails and yeah. just loving everything he could see and smelling everything and touching everything where there's a windstorm that comes and he decides to climb a tree in this windstorm to experience it fully. So he's at the top and he's just, you know, yeah. whipping back and forth up there. <laughs> pretty evocative. We, we spent quite a while on trying to make the uh, really try to sound like you're uh -huh. climbing a tree. You yeah, know, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Laborious. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and then there are these little piano interludes that maybe are him daydreaming or him thinking back to more difficult times in his life. Um, there's kind of some poignancy in these moments. And 
then the piece ends in this dream world where maybe all of his life's history and ideas and experiences are flowing through his brain as he's maybe lying there on a bed of pine needles looking up at the sky. like those images so well in, in the music and, and it, it just takes that extra step and that's why I'm, I'm glad we like you know here we are two months before the concert they can already sing the piece so we have time to that's amazing. you know now they're on spring break and hopefully digesting it and and Great. living with it and I mean I'll be honest part of the reason that I, I called the concert come to the woods is because it's my favorite piece of yours and I knew we were gonna do it and it's a major piece it, it, it you know really can anchor the concert, but also I hadn't picked all the other music yet. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we were going to press on this over a year ago when we were doing our, our, uh, yeah, our season course. calendar uh, yeah. for all of this. But it's also an unusual piece. Like you are, are in a generation of people that, that seem to be lucky enough to be known as a choral composer. Uh, you know, I, I think back 100 or 200 years and, you know, most of the great composers weighed in and wrote some choral music, but none of them got famous for writing choral music. Like, you, you just couldn't. You needed to write symphonies or operas. Yeah, Maybe if you were Russian, a ballet, like, could, could catapult you up there. But, um, but then choral music tends to be like a three-minute, four-minute piece genre. Yeah. And, and Come to the Woods is so much yeah. longer and, and gives so much more of a dramatic arc. And it's much more satisfying I think mm. and we've got several of those pieces now in the concert that are much longer than just the three to four minute yeah thing and, and I don't yeah know, what, what does that give you as, as a palette like how did you get the idea that like I should write choral music that's longer than what most people will program <laughs> <laughs> well I think a lot of that comes from a church tradition right you needed a little bit of music to fill this one space in this in this that's ceremony right yeah in a church service so I think that that's where that shorter work idea came from. Mm -hmm. But now that choral music is so much more outside of the church, as far as taking a place on concert stage, and it's, and it's, you know, up there with opera and orchestral music, as far as how it's presented. Yes, I think that there's, there's an ability to, to treat it dramatically, like you would orchestral music or opera, like I mentioned before, or music theater or anything like that. And so, for me, I also, I really wanted to create a a world and take us on a journey and that's really hard to do in even four minutes five minutes yeah and so pieces like come to the woods which is around 11 minutes really allows us that space to breathe to be able to sit in a moment and really value it um and then shift to a different moment and really have this arc of an experience so i i really love being able to do that with longer longer pieces of music and yeah. and i think it's good for us especially when we get so many small sound bites and so many short videos like, you know, that, that we're just obsessed with in our culture right now that no, let's, let's just breathe. Let's be in a space and allow ourselves to go on a journey that's longer than 30 seconds. Yeah, no, it's right. Like this is the length of a substantial symphonic movement. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, and then yeah. I always think about it, it's the hardest thing about being a choral conductor uh, versus being a symphony conductor where once you pick your symphony, an hour of that is like taken care of. The composer already thought of the dramatic flow of how the music is going to yeah. work for an hour, and we need to stitch together multiple pieces to have that same kind of right of, of that true. intent. And uh, this is not the first time, but I, I really ORS loves doing this, bringing a composer to town uh, so everyone can meet the composer, you know, if they're, they're still alive. But also then creating some kind of dramatic arc out of your music, and in this case, it's interspersed. Um, probably in a, in a way you haven't before, just because we're going on tour this summer to Prague and Vienna and Salzburg. This concert is now your music and then Mozart, Mahler, and Bruckner. Uh, those are the 
the three counterpoints. But like, th- like you do. <laughs> yeah, but these are three composers who were well aware of how to write dramatic, longer form works. Yeah. And I yeah. think brought that into their, their choral writing, uh, yeah. such it is. So I, I think it actually is going to fit pretty well uh, Cool. Like well, I'm in, excited in to terms hear it. of mood. So, but yeah, we were not able to get any of the three of them to show up, unfortunately. So, oh, uh, shoot. Well, I'll, I'll give them a call. Okay. No, we're, we're all connected as composers, so let me, <laughs> let me see what I can do. <laughs> yeah. One of the things, there's, there's two like sort of feelings I've had rehearsing Come to the Woods that I kind of want to talk about. And one of them is, is the number of phrases and places in the piece that start with all of this exuberance and another glorious day, the wind, da, 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 yan, da, da, all of this like yeah. heroicness and, and I hate to say it, like kind of male energy that like comes out and then John Muir encounters nature and it just dissolves. <laughs> one of my favorite things that he like goes out in one mood and then you, you just feel him get overwhelmed by that and it's, it's that same sure. kind of idea of how quickly that kind of thing can dissolve when confronted by beauty or, or, or I don't know was that that sort of intentional did that come from reading his his texts or you think that's just sort of part of his ethos am I on to something am I crazy off base I, I don't know like no I think that's a I think that's a really astute observation and um I've forgotten who the author was now, but I was just listening to a podcast where they were talking about awe and how awe is this emotion that's so difficult to describe, but it's what what really changes us as humans. And and I think for me, this experience of awe occurs when you feel small. Um, Another example of like one of the most important instances of awe is when there's someone who does something really selfless and generous for you, another human that does that, right? So in a way, it makes you feel smaller. And I don't mean that in a bad way, right? But it's no. just, you know, it, 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 it puts you in that place. And I think that's what John would experience, right? When he goes and see these massive Douglas fir trees mm-hmm. uh, or, or the Yosemite Valley, you know, looking at Half Dome and El Capitan and, and just feeling so small and insignificant, and I think that's a really important thing that we need to do more of as humans. We are too obsessed with our species. We're too obsessed with our cultures and our, and our social elements. And we need to find ways to be small and to remember that we are a part of all of these things. And I think that's what John was getting at in a lot of his writings. Mm-hmm. So, so I tried to paint that with the musicality. Well, you definitely succeeded, and it, it's also another reason to call the concert this. I mean, coming to Portland in the Pacific Northwest, this is probably the area of the United States that would agree with that statement the most, um, uh-huh. and where that really is plugged into our, our ethos, because we are, even in our cities, so surrounded by this this natural beauty. Um, right. Uh, you know, seeing that right. in, in Portland and Seattle and, and this whole yeah. area of the country. Um yeah, it's it, it is. Yeah, that and that moment happens. They're actually the hardest moments for the choir to sing, right? To get from that energy and kind of these simplistic rah rah melodies into this very complex, yeah, overwhelming descriptions of nature. And yeah, it, it it's they're really extraordinary moments in the piece. Oh, thank you. Well, and another thing about those moments is they're really. I think influenced by Scottish drinking songs. <laughs> you know, the day was full of sparkling sunshine, yeah, and at yeah, the same time, yeah, like I yeah. just imagine you've got your your mm-hmm. your beer in your hand or whatever it is you're drinking yeah. at the same time and liven with one of those. So yeah. It has that that kind of feeling too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Ah. Uh, yeah. The pub to the forest. <laughs> yeah. Um, the other part, and part of this is just like a, I guess a direct pitch to anyone that's watching, but. 
you'll come and see the rehear the room we rehearse in, uh, which is the choir room at Portland State, uh, which is very uh, 1960s looking, nice linoleum and, and drop ceiling and uh -huh. uh, okay. no windows and old fluorescent lights. Um, it is it's it's a genuinely ugly room with no windows that I spend a decent percentage of, uh -huh. of my life in. Um, and when, when we recorded the end of Come to the Woods, um, it was one of the most transcendent things I've encountered uh, in years, just listening to that build up. And I, I almost burst into tears. I can't believe we can like conjure that up in this horrible room with no windows and fluorescent lighting. Like, don't, don't you really feel like you're somewhere else? At least I am. It's really cool. Huh. Beautiful. All right, now we better learn the rest of it. Listen, I did not feel like I was in that room anymore. Mm -hmm. Like that you had, through your music, summoned up, like, here we are. We felt like we're, we are in the woods where we're supposed mm -hmm. to be. And um, I've always love the piece, but I've never been to a concert where it was performed. Um, and and I've, I mean, I've only encountered, I've never conducted it until now. So I've only experienced it on recordings. And this is something we're forgetting in the Zoom age. So I'm saying say straight to the audience, if you like what you're hearing on this video, it's gonna be so much more powerful in person. There's, mm. there's just no substitute for like just yeah. really, and in this case, with the size of the choir, like you will really feel this, this long mm. crescendo at the end. You, you sort of talked about daydreaming or, or, or whatever, but yeah, to me, it just, it summons up something so much larger than life. Like just repeating the same phrase over and over again. I don't know, like wh where were you going with that idea? Like you use repetition a lot in your music. I think in some ways it's a meditation, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and not this, and I'm, I'm not a, a, you know, really frequent meditator. Mm -hmm. Um, sometimes as a part of my creative process, I use kind of like Edison did where, you know, he would sit in a chair and hold a hammer in his hand and he would sit there and he would begin to imagine things and kind of like get on the verge of sleep. And then it, he would drop the hammer and it'd wake him up you know, <laughs> like this. So like I'll lie down or I'll, I'll, you know, in my bed or on the floor or by the piano or something and like get into the space of a piece to imagine you know, being where it's going to be performed, having the choir or the ensemble in front of me, what does it feel like in that room? Because it's so hard to do with so many visual distractions um, and just get there. And so I think in some, some instances, like at the end of Come to the Woods, it's my hope that I'm creating this space for the audience to just bask in an emotional world. Um, and part of that is this kind of meditative state where you hear the same thing, so it's familiar, and then once you've become accustomed to something happening, you can then hear it change because you've tracked it. Um, so some of that is teaching the listener how to listen to the piece, giving mm -hmm. them signposts, giving them objects, helping to guide them along, but then hopefully also introducing the things or surprising them or pleasing them with whatever they hear. Um, that's, that's the hope for those moments. But yeah, I think an instance like that is really just to create a world of beauty that we can bask in. That's, that's the hope. Yeah. Well, again, well, as you're, you're going to hear in a second, or maybe you're hearing already, like it's really successful. Uh, oh, thank you. In this piece. And, uh, and there's, there's a similar sort of feeling. It, it comes out differently, but there is the same kind of, of repetition in Let My Love Be Heard, which we performed a few weeks ago at our sort of soiree uh, fundraiser. Um, mm -hmm. And, but in that case, like that piece, there's there's much more desperation in in sort of mm. like how that builds up, uh, and and like that you can take a sort of a similar compositional technique and get at something completely different. Uh, yeah, yeah, that one, um, I guess, musically is much more conservative than Come of Those, right? There's no yeah. key change in, yeah. in Let My Love Bear. It's completely diatonic. Yeah. which is not common for what I do. No. But I think for me, it was intentional to that because the person, the, the speaker of this poem, Alfred Noyes, I assume that it was him. He lost his wife very early on or much, much sooner than he should have in his, in their marriage. And 
So, uh, you know, I don't know the specific circumstance around this poem, but my guess is it's maybe in response to that experience, mm-hmm. wishing he could he could communicate back with his wife. Um, and so there is desperation, and I and I think that there is there's a a comfort of staying in the same key that 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 speaker hopes to to have that kind of stability, mm-hmm. and with that stability, they then can begin to try and express this really difficult emotion. So in a way it's like very, it's stay stable in some senses, but then because they're just trying to hold on. Yeah. Right. But then try to rise and, and express this idea. Yeah. And, and to me in that piece, yeah, you're, it's, it's almost like coming to terms with the dissonance that is at the end of the piece and accepting that that's where it is in your life. Um, mm, yeah. You know, yeah. like I've, I've rarely seen a piece that's like so clearly like, here's my thesis statement, like those, those hums and ooze at the beginning of the piece. It's like, that's the whole piece right there. Yeah. You know, yeah. Sort of like, sort of like the five paragraph essay. And then we go through like the whole thing, but right. yet, at the, yet at the end, you feel very differently about it. And most living composers I know would have resolved that at the end. Uh, and mm. to me, that's well, the coolest that... thing at the end. You don't, you, you stick with what you started yeah. with. You know, instead of the yeah, cheesy, in the, instead of the sort of the cheesy obvious, it's all going to be okay. You yeah, know, at the end. right. So. I, yeah, I mean, I think I don't want to shy away from the di- difficulty in life, right? And I think right. sometimes we see pieces or programs that are like darkness to light, all the bad stuff, but then everything's great again. And some things are better, but no, we're still going to have pain. Yeah. And I think that in certain contexts, that if that's the art, it does a disservice to the actual human experience. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and so, yeah, a, a little kind of nerdy um, theory idea with this piece is yeah. that that main chord that recurs throughout the piece, it's the third chord of the piece that we hear at the very opening. It's right. also the very last chord we hear. It's also the chord we hear at the big climax. Mm-hmm. It's we're in the key of E major and this is a four chord or it's an A chord, but it's got the G sharp on top. So it's actually, and the B. So it's actually the A chord superimposed with the home base E chord. So it's like this longing for home, but we're not quite home. So mm-hmm. it's this these two worlds that I think that are being bridged all at, at one moment that creates that, uh, that pull, that tension. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's... It's it's elegantly done, and I I mean I'm certainly as guilty as anyone else of these choral concerts about dark topics that end sort of okay because you don't want your audience to go home feeling hopeless. Well, sure, either, of course. You know, of but course. but I agree with you. Yeah. You also want to have some sense of yeah, like I do think a lot of America is in trouble because we we do buy into like oh when I find the perfect person my relationship is never going to have any problems. Oh and, my god! You know, yeah. like the, the Hollywood ending and, and all of that. The well, I think it's yeah. so fascinating. You know, I was raised on on these Disney movies. Yeah. You know, where everything works out in the end. There's the there's the one and it, and it screwed I think a lot of people of my generation up and and yeah. other generations, right? Yeah. Like this idea and so yeah, we have to come to terms with reality. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I actually think the current generation, which is growing up with Marvel movies now, really thinks that like if you just smash enough stuff for an hour and forty five minutes, it's all uh, going to work out. You know, just pick geez. the right person to smash stuff. And uh, oh my gosh! But, I mean, but isn't that reflected in how we're trying to solve all of our problems right now? If we just like, right. get angry enough and revenge crazed enough, and you know, the, interesting. The, I hadn't yeah. thought about that. Yeah. Hmm. It's not an original idea. I got that from my colleague, uh, Co- okay. Cody Raven Morris, who you'll, you'll uh, get, right. if you haven't met her yet, you'll, you'll get her. I have, yeah. 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 She's amazing. Yeah. Um, and then probably the hardest piece in, in the program is, is, is an attempt to deal with this very same thing, the And So I Go On, uh, which will start next week, so we don't have any audio of it uh, yet. But, I mean, this is a response to, to a really serious uh, tragedy. So I don't know if you want to tell us a little bit about what we have to you know, what prompted you to write that and and how you were able to really. So if back in the spring of 2014, I was at uh, a conference in California for choral music and I met two university choir directors, Jonathan Talberg and Herman Aguilar. Um, They were both at universities. They were engaged to be married the next year. Um, Wonderful, wonderful people. Like a good composer, I gave them both a business card, you know, Mm -hmm. and, and hope to maybe work with them someday. 
And that summer, John was going on tour with his choir in Europe. And Hermann came along, sang in the choir, and they were performing at a church in Italy. And Hermann died in the middle of the concert in, in John's arms at this church. And um, I just can't imagine. I still can't imagine what that must have been like. Um, and so later that year, when uh, John was going through Hermann's things, he went through his wallet, found some cash, a few credit cards, and found one business card. And it was mine. And so John called me and asked if I would write a piece in memory of Hermann. Um, and so I, I was hesitant at first and then ultimately decided to accept it. And I think that's always a difficult thing, right? To, to try to take on this responsibility of speaking to such enormous grief. Yeah. You know, what right do I have to do that? Um, but ultimately I think that that's, that's my duty is to listen and to attempt to try to um, speak to something, you know, not, not as if I'm speaking for the person, but about that, you know, like being an actor, I have to assume the role of a character and attempt to, to, to express that as deeply as possible. And so I, I decided to speak to my, my dear friend, uh, frequent collaborator, Todd Boss, who's a wonderful poet. And Todd created um, a two-sided poem, the voice of the living and the dead that, that speak back and forth. Because um, we were going to have double choir for the piece. And so um, it, it's just, uh, it's such an extraordinary text. And, and I remember when I was writing the piece, I was trying to incorporate, you know, lots of meaning like certain dates that were important to John and Hermann or the date of Hermann's birthday, you know, and assign pitches to the, to the numbers of these things and try to, you know, put all this stuff into the piece. And I found that that was just, it's like I was trying too hard. I wasn't just responding to what does the music need to say? You know, the meaning will come, I think, with that emotion. So the, the opening is very simple. It's these short little calls that kind of leave some silence as if you're you're calling and no one is answering you um and then there's a a back and forth that builds and builds to this climactic moment and then we move into this this hold on on the pitch g which is you know herman g for herman which is kind mm -hmm. of the second half of the piece um and then this solo voice comes and sings you know, and so I go on always, wherever you are, my lovely one. And, and it's as if this community begins and, and the lines just enfold everyone in this idea of not knowing what happened to this person, but that knowing that we will go on and they'll still be with us. Um, and then maybe a mother's voice, you know, soars over the top of it, uh, mm -hmm. of this, this texture. Yeah. No, I, I have been at performances of that piece. And mm. um, yeah, I always wind up thinking like, this isn't going to work. Like I, I read the text and I think about what you're writing about. And I'm like, this is going to be too manipulative. Like it, it's it's too hard. And, and like, mm. yeah, I don't quite know how you like actually found a way to do this. It, it feels very honest. Mm. Um, and just like you're you're actually living in that moment and, and trying to process grief, which I think is another huge challenge. Well, for all humans, but especially in our society, as we were just talking about where we sort of believe that grief or sadness is a problem. Like we're supposed to be happy all the time. And, uh, yeah, you know, and, and yeah. Yeah. And maybe this is the, the, the pairing I'm most excited about in the concert. Um, so Mahler is my favorite composer. And of course, Mahler didn't write any choral music. Um, but I've discovered uh, this person, I, I heard a lot of his music done by Kammerkor Stuttgart last summer named Kleitus Gottwald, uh, who just died. He was almost 100. He was a German composer and choir director. And he started doing choral versions of famous like Mahler and Strauss and all of this. So he yeah. rewrote the fourth movement of Mahler's Resurrection Symphony, my, my favorite symphony, as a choral piece. Um, for eight part or more Divisi choir, um, double choir like yours. And it's the Urlicht, the, the light that shines to take us to whatever is next or mm. that essence of <clears throat> whatever it is that we return to or came from or, or unclear. It's a text from Das Knaben Wunderhorn, which is a 
you know, certainly a, a German attempt, a non-religious 19th century attempt to like, or maybe uber-religious attempt to try to synthesize a lot of these yeah. mysteries of life. So to hear, and so I go on, and then Mahler's response to the very same issue, mm -hmm. like back to back, I think is going to be uh, mm -hmm. a, really, uh, yeah, be... a really cool pairing. Uh, yeah, I can't wait to hear that. In the concert. So yeah, mm -hmm. uh, it's really stunning. Um, and tell us a little bit about Ritual, if you're allowed to. I mean, this won't air until <laughs> after it's premiered, but we're really excited about this to be the... And, and to be honest, this has been Oregon Repertory Singers' role in life. We've never had much of a budget for commissioning. Mm. Uh, but I actually think that's okay. And my predecessor, Gil Seeley, who ran Oregon Repertory Singers for its first 35 years, uh, wound up in the same problem, but then I, I think he wound up thinking it's a bonus. Like for most composers, you've probably encountered this, whoever commissions the piece will premiere it. Mm -hmm. um, for a piece to get a second performance is actually harder than it getting a, a first performance. And that's true. Gil really relished the, I'm going to do the Portland, he's going to, he talked to all of his colleagues and this is what I do now. What's the best music that's out there. And then I'm going to be the one to bring it to Portland and give cool. second or third or fourth performances. Um, at the upper end, Oregon Repertory Singers, we believe, was the first American ensemble to ever perform anything by Arvo Pärt. Mm. Um, and wow. in the 90s did the first American recording of the Berliner Mass, which I think is, is the first uh, American recording of anything by Arvo Pärt. Wow. Um, I don't know if there's any way to check it. Gil claims to have done the second performance of Leonardo Dreams of His Flying Machine. Uh, <laughs> so by, wow. by, by Eric Whitaker, we were one of the first groups yeah. to do the Rachmaninoff all night vigil after wow. like, Robert, Robert Shaw brought it back to, to life. And so this, this yeah. is something we've, we've, cool. we've done a lot of, and I guess we'll now do get to do the Portland premiere and second performance of, of ritual. So, yeah, well, I think that's, a, that's such a great thing. And yes, we, we love groups that, that take on relatively new works you mm -hmm. know, to give that yeah. second performance and let them have a life beyond the premiere. Yeah. Um, so Ritual, uh, I finished uh, in December of 2022. And um, Ritual is a, a piece that has no text. It's all a created language to, um, I think, to keep it uh, so it's nonspecific um, and also kind of just free me from words. Actually, last year, I... I had done so much music that was really, um, hmm, how do I describe it? That, that had a lot of really serious questions to ask that dealt with a lot of really difficult things. And I think I needed something that didn't just connect me deeply with a specific meaning. Mm -hmm. I needed something to have a little bit more space for interpretation, a little bit more freedom than having to stick to a specific text. And, but that also could express some grit and some, you know, some, mm -hmm. some gnarly feelings. And so I, I wouldn't say that it's hard to listen to, but it's, there's intensity to this, this mm -hmm. piece. And I guess for me, um, it's a piece that is, and of course, none of this is specific because there are no words to describe it. Right. For me, it's a piece that's exploring this idea of ritual. And what are the rituals that we have in our society, in our world, that we continue to do without thinking about them, just because that's what we've always done? When in reality, we should probably actually look a little more deeper into this and maybe reconsider yeah. this idea, you know? And that can be anything from, you know, a, a social event to a religious event to a governmental event. Like, there are so many different aspects of what this word ritual means yeah. um and so it's it's choir and piano and then two percussionists that flank the piano that play floor toms those those large drums that, like a drum set has you know on the floor mm -hmm. um and so there's there's this kind of raucous quality and then this soft middle section with a soloist who's continuously interrupted by the mass and then the mass takes back over at the end of the piece yeah. Yeah. No, I'm really excited about it. And with your permission, we might use Brazilian samba drums, those sordo drums, which are kind of like floor tums, but louder uh -huh. and bigger um, okay. and lower just because there's 120 singers in this choir. So I think we can yeah. 
you know, we can balance that. So cool. they're also, they're also cool. one of my favorite timbres of an instrument. I don't know if you know what I'm, I'm talking about, huh. but they're, yeah, basi- yeah. they're basically like larger floor toms, but they're used for those giant outdoor parades in, in Brazil and in South yeah. America. So they're, they carry and they have a lot of edge to them. And well, I guess that's, yeah. that's a ritual in love it. of itself that they're used for. I love it. So, yeah. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. Oh, and I guess I should ask you to tell us a little bit about Joshua Rist, because he's somebody that you've worked with a decent amount who's from Salem, and we're doing one of his pieces on the concert as well, and he'll be there. Also, we're doing The Runner, but uh, tell us what drew you to his uh-huh. music and to him. Uh, so Josh Rist is just one of the most extraordinary humans that I know, and he's someone who's so authentically him and and just loves people and wants them to succeed and wants to show them love. And I think he does that so well as a person, but then also with his art. And so we we struck up a friendship uh, maybe a couple of years ago now, and um, started wanting to to join together to to do festivals and kind of bring our two perspectives to that to that kind of an event and and help people engage more deeply with art making, with singing, with thinking a little bit more about the words that they're singing and how the music comes together and. And he's just a great guy. And we like to do outdoor activities together, you know, hiking and ice climbing. And, you know, we've, <laughs> we've done all that stuff. So I'm really, really excited that Josh is going to be there and, and a part of this too. Yeah. And both of you will get to work with our youth choir as well and get yeah. much, much more into that side of things. So, yeah. Yeah. Which will be great. Yeah. And, you know, Josh went to Oregon State with a whole lot of members of Oregon repertory singers. So he really is you know, uh-huh. part, part of the, the extended. Family. Yeah. Well, very much. I mean, yeah. so many of those singers are so excited that we're doing a piece of his. So, yeah, yeah, it's great. I'm so excited to come to Portland. Uh, I I do feel like the Pacific Northwest is very near and dear to my heart. Um, just being in that place with the trees, with the natural beauty, it's it's a place I love. And to be able to make music with such an extraordinary group is a huge, huge highlight of my year. Um, and and also to have so much of my music on one concert, it's it's a great honor and a joy for me. So I'm just, I'm so thrilled. I, I really appreciate all the work you've done. And I hope so many people come because I think it's going to be a really, really special event. Um, 